How, how many of you feeling good today? You feeling good today? This, this is our fifth service today, our fifth service uh, this weekend, and every service has been full like this. And uh, thank you so much. You know, it was supposed to rain. I was actually glad it was raining so people couldn't go to the beach and do other things. They had to come to church, <laughs> nothing else to do. Uh, but uh, thank you again for being here. If you're a first time uh, visitor here, we welcome you uh, uh, to Shepherd Church. And you look so good in your Easter outfits. I, I want you to turn to whoever you're sitting next to and just say, your Easter attire, it's so good you look like a movie star. Go ahead and say that to them. <laughs> How many of you know that God deserves our very best? He deserves our very best. He really does. Last weekend, if you were here at church, we watched The Passion Play, which was a production that we uh, did here at the church, and we filmed it, and we edited it for uh, television. And uh, this week, we put it on nationwide television, and there were several people who helped us, the Great American Family Channel, and God TV and other networks uh, allowed us to do that. And potentially, it was uh, put into some 500 million homes had a chance to at least watch that. We hope that they tuned in, amen? But the details of the Passion Play vividly reminds us of that moment in time 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on a rough, rugged Roman cross and he was taken off that cross and buried in a borrowed tomb where after three days, seemingly, it was the end of his life, but we all know what happened, don't we? And the reason we gather here today in record numbers, and I might add with record enthusiasm, is to celebrate the fact that Jesus resurrected and conquered the grave, amen? Let's thank the Lord for that. One of the best times of the whole year, if you're a sports fan, and I know that you're not, I know many of you are not sports fan, I understand that, but if you are a sports fan, one of the favorite times of the year is this thing called March Madness. And uh, this is where the top 68 teams in uh, college basketball, they compete in a season-ending tournament for a national championship. And the best college player today, because uh, I think you know this, but this Easter, this year, falls smack dab in the middle of March Madness. It's going on right now. And the best player in college basketball, one of the most exciting, is actually a girl by the name of Caitlin Clark from the University of Iowa. And I know many of you have never seen her, ever heard of her, but this uh, Caitlin Clark, she's something else. And right this year, she broke the all-time college record. She is now the all-time leading scorer in college basketball, male or female. She holds the record. And I have about a one minute, just in case you've never seen her, I want you to meet her. She's about one minute long video, a sizzle reel. You know what that is. I want you to see Caitlin Clark if you've never seen her. Here she is. She's not normal. You to shoot for Clark. She'll need the heroics here.
Oh, she's pretty good. I, I, I think she could play at Shepherd Sport Program over here at the church. That's what I think. But you know, in all the world of athletics, a team or a person, they try to go through a season undefeated. And there's, from time to time, you might go through a particular season. Again, it could be in business. It could be in life. But there's only one person that I know of in the annals of history who's undefeated for all time, and his name is Jesus Christ. Today, I want you to take your Bibles and open them up and turn to Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, and grab your sermon notes, if you will. And you can see by the title of this message, I have titled this message, Undefeated, Undefeated. And today, I want to connect the dots, so to speak, and show you how the resurrection of Jesus Christ defeats everything in life and everything in this world that is out to destroy you. I have three points, and they're simple points. Point number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Only Jesus can defeat your doubts. Only Jesus can defeat your doubts. There are people here today that are not believers. They're not Christians. They're here But the reason they've never become a Christian is because they have doubts, they have questions that have never been resolved. And so I want you to know that any doubt that you have, it's never going to be resolved until you come to have faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There, uh, in the text here in Luke chapter 24, I wanna give you the background of what we're reading. Jesus has already died, he was buried, three days later, He resurrected. So this is after the resurrected, after the resurrection. Now, his disciples that he had spent three and a half years with, they saw him die. They saw him uh, put in that uh, tomb. They have heard that he has resurrected, but they've not seen him yet. And so they've been told, but they, they, they don't really believe it. And so this is this moment where Jesus shows up to show that he's alive. So that's the background to this text. In verse 36, it says, while they were still talking about all this, guess who shows up? Jesus stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. In other words, chill, 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 chill. Verse 37, the Bible says they were startled and what? Frightened, thinking that they had seen a what? A ghost. Now, this is before they had these things called holograms. This is before AI. They literally thought that he's a ghost. Verse 38, Jesus said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts, everybody say the word doubts. Why do doubts rise in your minds? And to answer those doubts in verse 39, he says, look at my hands. Look at my feet, it is, it is I myself, I'm not a ghost. Touch me and see. You see, the resurrection is what erases their doubts about Jesus. Now in your notes, I want you to write this down. The word doubt in the Greek is a word that means a discussion or a negotiation. And that might seem confusing to you that the word doubt is a word that means discussion. However, it might make sense if we hearken back to the old cartoons that we used to watch when we were children, when there was a character who had to make a difficult moral decision, and two small figures would appear on each shoulder. On one shoulder would be an angel, and on the other shoulder would be a devil. And the angel and the devil would debate back and forth about what the character should do. And that's a good visual on what it means to have doubt. Doubt is the opposite of being convinced. Instead of being convinced in what we believe, many people go back and forth. And what that's called in the Bible is being double-minded. There are many people who are double-minded. You know, one day you believe this, and the next day you don't believe that. One day you're sure about this, and the next day you're not so sure. Maybe this very moment there are certain things in your life where your heart tells you one thing and your mind tells you something else. 
Some people have doubts about the Bible. Is the Bible really God's word or is it a man-made book? Some people wonder, does God exist? Is God real? Some people have doubts about whether or not God even actually answers prayer. Some people doubt the story of creation. I heard about a man once, he was talking to his friend, and this man, he, he didn't necessarily believe in God. He didn't think God existed. He, he couldn't understand God. He thinks a lot of things that, that God did didn't make sense. And so he says to his friend, he said, if there is a God, and if God knew what he was doing, why would God create such a giant pumpkin with such a tiny little vine? It makes no sense whatsoever. And they were standing outside underneath an oak tree, and he looked up, and he said, and why would God, if there is a God, why would he have this giant oak tree come from such tiny little acorns? That doesn't make any sense to me. And about that time, the wind blew, and one of those little acorns broke loose and came down and hit him in the head. And his friend said to him, aren't you glad that wasn't a giant pumpkin? <laughs> so questions are okay if questions lead you to discover a thing called truth. We have doubts about the virgin birth. We have doubts about the miracles of the Bible. We have doubts whether or not Jesus is the Messiah. But the one miracle that erases all of my doubts is the miracle of the resurrection. If I have faith in the resurrection and believe in the resurrection, that faith erases all doubts. I want you to write this down. Doubt is the opposite of faith. It's the opposite of faith. If you could understand everything you wouldn't need faith. I mean, if I could answer all your questions, and people always say, Pastor, I have a question for you. If I could answer all your questions logically, then you wouldn't need faith. Doubt is the opposite of faith. One actually cancels the other. If you doubt all the time, you would not be walking by a thing called faith. And if you walk by faith, then there would be no need to doubt. Some folks, or well-meaning folks, use their doubts as an excuse not to follow Jesus. In other words, I would follow Jesus, but I have these doubts. And until my doubts are resolved, I'm never going to believe in Jesus. And I would suggest to you today, you need to start doubting your doubts. Doubt your doubts. Don't doubt the truth of the Word of God. Study the Word of God. And as you study it, as you learn it, as you apply it, you'll come to discover that it's true. I believe that Satan has 10,000 ways when you're trying to do the right thing. Satan has 10,000 ways to come into your mind, come into your heart, come into your life, and try to cause you to have doubts so that you will not serve God. You know, if you had never heard of, like, like, like and I know this is impossible to even think about this, but if you had never been told, never heard, ever in your life about a thing called conception and I explained it to you. You'd never heard of it. And I said, let me tell you what happens. You take this seed from this man. You, you, it's so small you can't see it with the naked eye. And it connects with an egg from a female and it's so small, the egg is so small, you cannot see it with the naked eye. And what happens is that seed connects with that egg and a cell is formed. And you're not gonna believe this, but the cell begins to multiply and nine months later, out pops a baby and it starts to scream and it looks just like you. <laughs> you would say, no way. <laughs> you see, a baby being born is a miracle. Every baby that's born is a miracle. But we take it for granted because it's so common to us. I want you to write this down. It is no more difficult for God to raise the dead than it is for him to create life. The same God that can create life is the same God that can raise the dead. So when Jesus came out of that grave 2,000 years ago, that should erase all your doubts. Remember what he said. Why do, you, why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. I'm not a ghost. Touch me and see. If Jesus truly resurrected, I don't have to doubt that he can answer prayers. I don't have to doubt that he has the power to do a miracle. I don't have to doubt that he's the true Messiah. I don't have to doubt that he's the King of kings and the Lord of all lords. Amen. Amen. Let's thank the Lord. Come on. So the second thing in your notes, 
that Jesus defeats, only Jesus, and I want to talk to you about this, only Jesus can defeat your despair. No one else can defeat your despair. You say, what is despair? That's kind of a weird word. What is that? Uh, turn to your neighbor and say, hey, what is despair? What, what, is, what, is, what is that? Just say, chill, chill. The pastor's going to explain it. He's going to explain it. I, I, I want you to write this down. Here's a definition of despair. Despair is the complete loss or absence of hope. That's despair. I'll tell you when this happens. There's several moments in life where this happens. This happens when the doctor calls you and says, I, I, I'm sorry to inform you that you have inoperable, inoperable stage four cancer. There's nothing we can do. That's despair. When you have a child and you've raised this child in your household and you've taught this child all the things that child needs to know and then one day they meet someone and takes them down the wrong path and they become a prodigal son and they become a prodigal daughter and they go so far down this road that you no longer even recognize your child. That's despair. When you get a phone call in the middle of the night telling you that a loved one has taken their own life that's despair. When you get an email that says you've been laid off work and you don't have health care any longer, that's despair. When you're battling an addiction and this addiction is destroying your life and you've done everything you know to do to overcome this addiction and no matter what you try, you just can't seem to, 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 to be loose from this addiction, that's despair. There are certain times in your life where you feel as though there are no solutions, where you feel like you cannot go on another day. It's almost like you're living with a panic attack 24 hours a day, that's despair. Well in John chapter 20, I want you to turn to your Bibles at John 20, we meet a woman and guess what her name is? Her name is Mary, everybody say Mary. Mary. Now in the Bible there are many different women named Mary, it was a very common name back in those days. This Mary in John chapter 20 is not, it is not the mother of Jesus. That's a different Mary. This Mary in John 20 is from a little town on the western side of the Sea of Galilee called Magdala. Her name is, she's known as Mary Magdalene. And if you've ever read the Bible and studied her life, you'll know that she had seven, not three, not four, not five, she had seven demons living inside of her until she met Jesus, and Jesus cast those demons out of this woman, and she became a follower of Jesus and actually began, began to be a part of his inner circle. And you may, may or may not know this, but Mary Magdalene, this woman who'd had the seven demons in her and been, and been set free and now in the inner circle, she was the first person to ever see Jesus after the resurrection. And it's found here in John chapter 20. I want to read this to you because I think she helps us understand this point that only Jesus can help you overcome despair. The Bible says early on the first day, everybody say the word early. Early on the first day, that would be a Sunday. While it was still dark, the sun was still coming up, Mary Magdalene, there she is, she went to the tomb and she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And so she came running over to Simon Peter, he's one of the 12, and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved. Now that's John. And I don't know why, but John always calls him, John wrote this, but John always refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved. He wanted you to know that. So she runs over to Simon Peter, the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, and she said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple, that's John, they started for the tomb. Now look at verse four. Both of them were running, the Bible says. And so John wants you to know that he and Peter are having a race. And the Bible says both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter. He wanted you to know that he was faster than Peter. <laughs> I don't know why. 
The boat, both were running, and the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over, this is John, he looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, the turtle, <laughs> who was behind him, arrived finally. He went into the tomb and he saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up all by itself, separate from the linen. Verse eight, finally the other disciple, who had reached the, tent, the tomb first, he wants you to know, he, I, he just keeps telling you he's faster than Peter, I don't know why. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside, he saw, the Bible says, and what happened? He believed. Verse nine, they still did not understand from the scriptures that Jesus had to rise, rise from the dead. Verse 10, now here, here comes Mary. The disciples, where do they go? Well, they go back to their homes. But Mary, here she is, Mary Magdalene. She stood outside the tomb. What's the Bible say? She's crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. She sees two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been. One of those angels was at the head. One of the angels was at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? And she answers, I'm crying because they have taken my Lord away and I don't know where they've put him. Verse 14, at this she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. You say, well, how could she stand next to Jesus and not recognize him? Don't forget, over and over again, she's weeping, she's crying, she can't see through her tears. Verse 15, woman, he said, why are you crying? Jesus asked her, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? And thinking that he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go get him. This is an amazing story. Mary Magdalene goes to the tomb. Her heart is broken. She's crying. She's weeping. She is in despair. This is a definition of despair. She is mourning. She is grieving. In her mind, Jesus is gone. She gets to the empty tomb. She looks inside. There's a fog of uncertainty. She doesn't think or believe that Jesus is alive. She simply thinks that someone has moved his body. And I want you to write this down. She's in the right place, but she's looking for the wrong thing. She's exactly where she should be, but she's looking for a dead Jesus. And Jesus is there. He's alive, but she's in despair. She's weeping and mourning and grieving because she doesn't understand the realities of the resurrection. I love verse 15, because it says, thinking that he was the gardener. And that's not even the funny part. The funny part is the next part. She said, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I'm gonna go get him. Now, I don't know this for sure, but let's assume she weighs 110 pounds. And Jesus weighs about 165 pounds. We don't know what he weighs. We do know that tradition says that he was wrapped in 75 pounds of spices. And so this woman says, tell me where you put him, and I'm gonna go get a 225 pound uh, corpse and sling him over my shoulder, and I'm gonna bring him back to this tomb. You know what you call that? That's love. That's love. But even though she loves Jesus, I want you to see her grieving. I want you to see her broken. I want you to see this woman full of despair because she doesn't understand the resurrection. And at this point in the text, Jesus couldn't conceal himself any longer because verse 16, the very next verse says that Jesus says to her, Mary, he calls her name. And when he calls her name, she recognizes his voice. 
And she turns to him through those teary eyes and she cries out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. I want you to write this down. She is drowning in despair until she sees the resurrected Lord. Everything, and I mean everything, changes after she understands the resurrection. Her sorrow is replaced by joy. Her grieving is replaced by song. Her mourning is replaced with celebration. Her hopelessness is replaced with hope. And the same is true for many of you here today. Oh, I'm so glad you came to Shepherd Church today. You're in the right place. But did you know there are many people here in the right place, but there are people here today looking for the wrong thing? Oh, you came to the right place. Amen. But there's some people here today that came just because they want to put a check mark in a little box that says, hey, I went to church this year. There are people here today, you only came for a meal because you got invited to church. You said, I don't want to go. And they said, hey, you just come, come, please come. I'll take you out to eat afterwards. Oh, okay, I'll come. <laughs> Do you know there's some people here and the reason they came to church is because they're looking for a date? I mean, there's people here. How many single people here? Raise your hand real high, real high. See, there you go. No, 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 no. You know, you, try, you tried looking in the clubs. You couldn't find what you were looking for in the clubs. And I will tell you right now, you're not going to find what you're looking for in the clubs. So let's go to church. There's, there's, just, there's good people there, and there's, there's people here. Some people came to church today because they want to get that 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 perfect picture for the social media post. They, 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 you know. And do you know this is true? I know this to be true. There are people here today, uh, they don't believe in Jesus, but they, they've had a, they're in a rough season right now in their life, and everything's going wrong, and somehow it went through their mind. You know what, maybe, maybe if I go to church, they, they said this, maybe if I go to church, my luck will change. And I say to you today, Open up your eyes. Open up your heart and understand that the resurrected Lord is here today. Amen. If, if, if you believe that he's still in the grave, then all hope is lost. Despair wins. Life is empty. Life is meaningless. Life is void. What you should be searching for, and I'm glad you came, again, you came to the right place, is not for a man still in the grave. You should look to the one who conquered the grave. You should look to the one who conquered the tomb. You should look for the man who rose again. And if you study scriptures, you'll see and understand, once you see and understand and know the resurrected Lord, the Bible says that as soon as you put your faith and trust in him, that Jesus in spirit form comes to live and dwell within you, and when Jesus Christ is in you, it doesn't matter the obstacle that you're up against or the trial that you're going through. If Jesus Christ is in you, you've got that power in you. You'll get through any situation in this life. The Bible says in Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body through his spirit who lives in you. Have you ever bought a toy or a gadget and you couldn't wait to open it and once you opened it, you realized that the, it, the batteries were not included? <laughs> Do you know that that's the difference between Christianity and all other religions? That's the difference between Christianity and secularism. That's the difference between Christianity and, and atheism. That the false religions of this world, and there are many, they're all packaged and they look great but there's no power because there's no, there's no batteries. Without Jesus Christ's power in you, you have no power, you have no hope. But if you know Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, he puts that power within you, then you can overcome any addiction. You can have any relationship restored. You can have any wound be healed. You can have any barrier torn down. 
You can have any window opened. You can have any sin forgiven. You can have any marriage rebuilt. You can have any prodigal child returned home. You can have any burden erased and any heartache can be lifted if the resurrected power of Jesus is within you. And number three, Jesus can defeat your doubts, he defeats your despair, but Jesus defeats your death. They just came out with the latest statistics that every single person who's born dies. <laughs> That's the statistic. Puritan Thomas Brooks wrote that death's motto is this, I yield to none. You've all heard that phrase, Father Time is undefeated. Well, in Hebrews 9, verse 27, the Bible actually tells us it is destined. It, 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 is, your, it is your destiny to die once. I want you to write this down. Death is your greatest enemy. Death is your greatest enemy. And whether you realize this or not, death is coming after you right, 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 right now where you're seated. Death is coming after you. Now, when you're in your 20s and your 30s, you never even think about this sobering truth. Well, the first 20, 30 years of your life, I don't know if you know this, but you're actually getting better looking. I mean, go back and look at your high school photo and look at what you look like in your 20s. You get better looking in your 20s and 30s. You get more beautiful. You get more handsome. You get more confident at your job. Death never even crosses your mind. But when you get into your 40s and your 50s, <laughs> things start to change. You're not as sharp, you're not as quick. You get a little hint of it when you get a gray hair, a little bit of gray hair, if you have hair. <laughs> Your eyes are not as sharp. You don't like the, kid, the music that the kids are listening to. You can't, you start, you, you wanna go to bed earlier than what you used to. Now when you get in your 60s and your 70s, everything changes. When you get in your 60s and 70s, you can't hear anything. <laughs> and I know this to be true because I'm in that age group right now. <laughs> you cannot eat a single meal without spilling something on your clothes. You just can't do it. I've tried. You just can't do it. And when it gets to be about 8 o'clock at night, you're in bed. And when you're in your 60s and 70s, every, everything, I, when I say everything, I mean everything, everything sags. Can I get a witness on that? Now, when you get into your 80s and your 90s, all of your friends have died. None of your parents are alive. And you start to think how quickly life flew by. And you try to cope with it with humor, like the guy that said, I'm not afraid of dying, I just don't want to be there when it happens. <laughs> and I heard of a newspaper reporter who wrote, when I realized how expensive funerals are, I began to exercise and watch my diet. But honestly, he said, the only benefit of exercising every day is that you die healthier. <laughs> but I want to read to you what the Bible says, because I got some good news. How many of you want to hear some good news? Because even though, even though death is coming after me, I got some good news. Here's what the Bible says. In a flash, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true that death has been swallowed up in a thing called victory. In fact, where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? But it doesn't sting for the believer because we know what the Bible promises us. 
And verse 57 says, but thanks be to God, he gives us the what? The victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, of all the enemies that you face, some of you are here today and you're battling some sickness or disease, that is not your greatest enemy. Some of you have a neighbor that is suing you right now over something silly. Your neighbor is not your greatest enemy. Some of you are here today, you know, it's coming up on April 15th, uh, IRS is after you. Uh, the IRS is not your greatest enemy. Racism, racism is not your greatest enemy. Addiction is not your greatest enemy. Your greatest enemy is death, but write this down. 1 Corinthians 15, we just read it, explains what your only hope. And your only hope is found in a person named Jesus Christ. He is your only hope, amen? Steve Jobs uh, invented Apple Computer. It was 1976. I was a senior in high school. That's how old I am. But I remember walking down this hallway, and I, I could take you to that hallway, and I, I know right where the, root, the class was. It was a large school, but I remember this one hallway. I'd walk down, I'd look in a window inside this door, and I saw all these nerds in there. And I'm like, what are, the, what are those guys doing in there? And they had these little boxes. They were, they were computers. They were like almost a, a square. They were called Apple computers, first computers. Had a green screen, had one little cursor thing flashing on it, and they would type, and the cursor would like type or move. I thought, well, these guys are wasting their time in there. Steve, Steve Jobs, when he invented Apple Computer, he was like 22 years old. By the time he was 26, He was worth $250 million, a quarter of a billion dollars. Today, Apple is worth between, as a company, between two and three trillion dollars. When he was 49 years of age, 49, he got diagnosed with cancer. And with, within six years, he died. When he died, he had a personal net worth of over $10 billion. But that $10 billion couldn't buy him what you have here today, which is a chance to get up and come to church, worship, study the Bible, and say yes to Jesus. When he died, he was not a Christian. He never believed in God. But right before he died, and this is true with a lot of people who say they're atheists, he started to think to himself, well, when I die, is that the end? Like, you haven't been thinking about this? No. He had too many good things in his life. But when you come up against death, you start to think, and here's what he said. He said, he said, there, he said I now, because he never believed before. Right before he dies, he goes, I, I now think there's about a 50-50 chance that what we do here on life endures. He said, that's why maybe I never put the, the on-off switch on my, my, my Apple product because I didn't want things to just shut off. I remember sitting here in church, it was on a Sunday morning, uh, I was preaching, while I was preaching, it happened today too, a heli I heard a helicopter. And I don't hear a lot of helicopters when I'm in church, I hear a lot of other things, I don't hear helicopters, but there's a helicopter. And in between services I go to my office and they tell me that Kobe Bryant had just passed away in a helicopter crash. He had, if you, if you check the flight pattern for that helicopter, they came up from the valley and they came up to the northern edge up here, the 118, they flew across right over the church and then they went down to Calabasas where they, they, that helicopter crashed. And just like that, his life is over. And we just need to be reminded today that everything that we are pursuing here in this life, that only Jesus can erase your doubts, only Jesus can help you overcome despair and only Jesus can help you at that moment 
when your destiny with death happens. I told you five months ago, my mother, she's 92, she lives up here in Fresno, and she was diagnosed with cancer, and it's all through her body, and the doctors told her she only has six months left to live. That was five months ago. And we were all praying that she would make it to Easter. We just wanted her to have another Easter. And uh, she's, she's still holding on. Uh, but she, she got, she got cancer. It's all, it's all through her spine. It's in all of her organs. She's 92. She does, she, she, she wants to go, she's ready to go to heaven. But she only has a few weeks left. And the other day she said, son, this mama, she goes, How, how's this all going to end? I said, Mama, you want to know how this is going to end? She goes, yeah, I, I just want to know how it's all going to end. I said, Mama, Mama, I know exactly how it's going to end. She goes, you do? I go, yeah, Mama, I know how it's going to end. I've seen this thousands of times. Now, could God heal her today? Yes, he could. But God's got a thousand ways to transition us from this life into the next. And it's already been written down. I wouldn't worry about it. I hope you're listening. I wouldn't worry about it. It's already written. He knew the day of your birth and he knows the day of your death before you were even conceived. So there's no need to worry. You need to get up and live every day for God is what you need to do. But I said, Mama, I said, Mama, unless the Lord heals you, here's, the, here's how this is gonna go down. Because she's in pain. She's in constant pain. I mean, just her whole body's just covered in pain. I said, Mama, the doctors are just gonna keep increasing your pain medicine so you don't feel this pain. And we're in this season right now where one week it's here, it's like she's getting this thing two times a day, and now it's three times a day, and now it's four. They just keep increasing. I said, Mama, you're gonna keep feeling pain. And then they're just gonna keep increasing it. And finally, Mama, you won't even feel the pain and you're gonna fall asleep, and the next moment, mama, you're gonna wake up and you're gonna be in the presence of God. And mama, it's not gonna be the end, it's gonna be the beginning of you being in heaven for all of eternity, and all God's people said. I close with this last thought, and we're gonna pray. Everything that we talked about today, Jesus dying on a cross for your sins, being buried three days later, resurrecting. If you put your faith and trust in him, he puts that same spirit inside of you so that when your day of death comes, that just like Jesus resurrected, that you too will resurrect, all of that. If you're here today and you're a skeptic and you're here today and you don't believe this and you're here today and you're a doubting Thomas and you're not a Christian because there's just, you have questions, let me just say this to you. If you had any sense, you should want this to be true. You should want this to be true. Because without it, you're gonna die in despair. You're gonna die with your doubts. But if this is true, and you put your faith and trust in Jesus, then you have nothing else to worry about because this life goes by so quickly, but you are secure in Christ because of your faith and belief in what Jesus did for you on the cross 2,000 years ago. And as Jesus conquered the grave, you too will conquer the grave and live with him forever and ever. Let's stand and bow our heads for a word of prayer. Let's all pray. God, thank you for today and thank you for this incredible church and for the time of worship that we had today and the great crowds of people that came in spite of not great weather. And the reason we're here today is just to celebrate Jesus, who is undefeated in the annals of history, where we are told over and over again that Father Time is undefeated. It has been defeated. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
And I pray if there be anyone here today, a man, a woman, a boy, or girl, and maybe they're here today and they're drowning in despair. They came to the right place, maybe for the wrong reason. I pray, God, that you would open up their heart, open up their eyes, and let them see that the resurrected Lord is here today. And they simply need to come and put their faith and trust in him. Over to my left, there's a baptistry with some doors. If you're here, don't leave, don't go out to your car. Just come down here to the front and walk through these doors. There are some decision counselors that are there that will help you with your confession of faith that Jesus Christ is your Lord, and if you need to be baptized, they will baptize you here today into his name. God, I pray your blessing upon every man, woman, boy, and girl who's here. I pray that you would watch over them, give them something in their heart that seeks you and you alone, and may we realize, God, that only in you, only in Christ can we find victory, we pray, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen, amen. amen. God bless you, and thank you for coming to Easter weekend.